Let me illustrate the problem that we are having by showing you some combinations of how nodes in an FBX scene can be related to one another. The simplest scene tree is one that has got separate nodes in it. Like we see here, we have three nodes, one for each object. We can move each object independently and if we were to import this scene, we would end up with three asset files. Another possibility is that objects are somehow grouped in a kind of subtree. Here we have a group node, but it could as well have been a light node or a camera node or even another mesh node, and the three objects here are now parented to this group node. So if we would move this group node, all objects within it would move with it. Of course we are still able to move each object individually, but their transforms are relative to the group node. Next example is one that we have already seen in the previous episodes, which is an object with multiple levels of detail. This is simply represented by an LOD group which has a number of mesh nodes as its children. This pretty much behaves as a group node except that child nodes are shown depending on camera's position. We can also parent a mesh node to another mesh node, as we see here. However, we are not limited to any particular combination. For example, a mesh node can have an LOD group as one of its child nodes. We can also go bananas and parent a group node to a mesh node, along with another mesh node hierarchy and an LOD group. We can even have an LOD group within another LOD group, which doesn't make much sense in practice, but we can totally create such a hierarchy and save it to an FBX file. So how do we make sense of all these possibilities while we don't support such combinations in our geometry format? Remember the submeshes in Primal Engine don't form any kind of hierarchy, except for objects with multiple LODs, which simply have a group of submeshes for each level of detail. Let me explain the strategy which I plan to use for this. As an example, suppose we have a mesh node, a group node with a couple of mesh nodes attached, and finally an LOD group with also some mesh nodes for each level of detail. In this case we would save the LOD group to a separate asset file, the meshes within the group node would be saved to another asset file, and finally the single mesh would be saved to yet another asset file. So we would get three asset files for this scene. But what if we had a more complicated scene hierarchy? Maybe we have a mesh tree with different meshes and even a group node in there. In this case I'll simply make a flat list of all meshes within this tree and save it to a single asset file. If there was an LOD group somewhere, we always save it in its own asset file. So in the example that we have here, the three meshes would be saved to one asset file and the LOD group and its meshes would be saved to another file. I believe this accounts for most of hierarchies that we could encounter while importing an FBX file. Obviously this is nothing but a design choice that I made here. Some game engines would actually use the FBX hierarchy to relate the game objects. For example, a car and its four wheels could be constructed as a mesh node for the car with four child mesh nodes for the wheels. In our engine, we'll either save each mesh in an asset file and relate them using game entities, or import all meshes as one object and use skeletal animation for spinning the wheels. To summarize, meshes on the same node tree will be saved in one asset file. Meshes in a group node will be saved in one asset file as well, that is if the group node is the root, otherwise it will be saved as a part of the mesh tree. So if a group node is parented to another mesh or group node, it will be part of the same asset. LOD groups are always saved in a separate asset file, regardless of whether they are parented or not. And finally, we will split meshes into submeshes by material, which brings us back to the model we have here. This version has all submeshes combined in a single mesh node that uses different materials. 
When you would separate these meshes in Maya, it will become rather difficult to work with since it splits into a large number of mesh nodes. I did this because the current implementation of our importer doesn't work with group nodes. However, I made another version of the same model which consists of only 5 mesh nodes grouped together. And according to the rules that I just discussed, it would be saved into a single asset file. I'm going to create a scene that consists of a group node, an LOD group, and a couple of mesh nodes. First I'll add an LOD group and also define some materials so we can see the objects more easily. Next I add our character model which is quite a bit larger, so let's scale everything to match. The default length unit in Maya is centimeters, so we need to scale things up if we are measuring in meters. I'm just playing with LOD thresholds a little bit here. And then I just duplicate this LOD group and parent it to one of the meshes from the character model. If our scene traversal code works as intended, we'll get three asset files when we import this file. Let me remove the files that we already have and drop the new FBX onto the editor to import it. As you can see, we get two files, but that's because two of the files that were saved had the same name. So we need to fix that where we determine asset file names. Everything else seems to be working correctly, although the LODs appear to switch a bit odd. To explain why that is, I'll create a group of objects, all of which have their own positions relative to the group. When we import this scene, we see that everything is centered around the origin. You can't see the cube because it's smaller than the sphere around it. I can try to make it larger or stretch it. However, as you can see, that didn't change the resulting mesh. The reason for this is that each node in the FBX scene has a transform matrix that we need to apply to each vertex when we import each mesh node. Looking at the imported geometry, we now see that the shapes are at positions that we would expect, but something is quite off with the shading. To explain what's happening, look at what happens when I transform this drawing. The green line represents a surface and the yellow line is the surface normal vector. Applying the same transform to both of them doesn't preserve the perpendicular property of the normal with respect to its surface. We can mathematically derive what we need to do to keep the normal vector perpendicular. I'm not going into details here, so feel free to pause the video and look up more about vector transformations. It turns out that we need to transform normal vectors using the inverse transpose of the transform matrix in order to keep it normal to the surface. In this example, after scaling the surface in the x direction, we need to apply the scaling to the normal vector in the y direction. Also remember that this transformation doesn't necessarily result in a unit vector, so we need to normalize the normal vectors afterwards. <laughs> 